Brooklyn Independent Television. But wow, Brooklyn really go for Why it? don't we just agree to this? Yeah, disagree. that's really gonna fly. Well, that's a good question. No, 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 no. Listen, that's exactly the point I wanted to make. Superstorm Sandy hijacked headlines around the world when it came ashore in New York City. Nowhere more than the local papers and blogs where Brooklynites get their news. As the waters rose, then receded, the stories began to pour in, and today's guests were on the front lines of the storm. This is Intersect, and today we're talking Sandy stories. I'm joined by Ned Burke, the editor at Sheep's Head Bites, and the New York Daily News reporter, Simone Weichelbaum. Thanks for being here today. Thank, Thank you. you. So when I was thinking about this story or this show and all of the stories that we've seen come in through Brooklyn Independent TV, most of which I've stolen from both of you guys on your blogs or on your papers, I was really struck by the sort of comparisons that happened with the Hurricane Irene last year and the way that we had our attitudes about this storm that was coming where a lot of people said, oh, well, it's not going to be a big deal, or there was all this hype last year and nothing happened, although some people were definitely impacted. It was nothing like we've seen. So just like let's press rewind for a minute. What were your impressions and what you were writing and thinking before this thing came to Brooklyn? So, I mean, the comparisons started long before it even made landfall, mm -hmm. uh, at least in my neighborhood. You know, we were writing about the storm, warning people, telling people what they need to know, where Zone A starts and ends, and um, where their evacuation centers are, um, all that kind of vital information. And the responses that we were getting in the comments of Sheep's Head Bites were, oh, it, yeah, it, Hurricane Irene was nothing, right. you know, it, it never hit us, this is just alarmism that's still coming from the snowstorm, that, yeah. you know. and we heard a lot of this, and it, it was, you know, you asked what I was thinking, and at the time I was thinking about how infuriating that is, that they're putting other people at risk by expressing this, um, mm. and, and kind of letting this become a, um, you know, a Yeah, the, the zeitgeist to say, exactly. oh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, um, and then, uh, I mean, the night the storm hit, you never heard that again. You know, yeah. I have not heard anything saying, oh, well, we shouldn't have evacuated. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, in, in the wake of it, I think the, the comparison is pretty obvious. I mean, one hit us, one didn't. We were lucky the first time around. We weren't as uh, lucky the second time. And let's hope in the future we can prepare better. I know you had a story about some NYCHA residents, too, and their response about whether they were staying or going or not, and a lot of them thought they'd hunker down. Same thing what Ned said. A lot of New Yorkers, me included, thought, like, you know, mayor's overreacting, mm -hmm. like, it doesn't really matter, right. just some, you know, rain, some wind. You mentioned I spent um, that afternoon right before Sandy hit in NYCHA at um, Red Hook Houses, and the women there were like, you know, if God wants to get us, he'll get all of us. Like, us going to a shelter, what's that supposed to do? Right. And, um... I, you know, not allowed to have opinions as journalists, but I understood what they were saying. Yeah. I thought it'd be like another day, some wind, some rain, go back to the other stories I wanted to do. Yeah. And, you know, ha ha, the joke was on all of us. And it was, um, as the night just went through, uh, my phone went dead. A lot of us it just hit us. I wasn't flooded like you were, but all I had was Twitter. Yeah. Because nothing was working. TV was out, internet was out. And I just remember seeing, like, this one story after another Coney Island hospital of reports that there was a fire there that right. um, didn't work out and then as a journalist you felt stuck like you couldn't leave yeah it's not like me running out into the street what is that supposed to do yeah, during well, a I'm not going to save the world yeah and the other hand you just don't want to sit there and it, you just felt so hope, um, helpless yeah. and hopeless at the same time and yeah. this fear of what's going to happen the next morning like S when the sun came out so I, I, I don't know if that's something particular to journalists where you feel that feeling of hopelessness slash helplessness but it is like you are an action orientated sort of person and I'm sure when the wind started blowing we all and the lights flickered we all felt that that that's just it what are you going to do but you in particular because it's your job to go out and tell everyone to stay home sort of thing yeah yeah I mean I I, I wouldn't you I wouldn't say we felt hopeless yeah uh, but we did feel helpless and I wouldn't say it's anything that's um, particular to reporters because you know at the, at the first you know precinct community council meeting after the storm the uh, the captain who's really only been on the job in the community for uh, 
a month or so. Yeah, I think yeah. it took took office like four days before the storm or something. Um, you know, he, he was talking about how helpless he felt because they were getting calls and they weren't allowed to go out and do anything. And that's probably a good thing, you know. Um, and it, it, it was the case for me that I felt helpless. I was, um, I stayed in Zone A. Mm -hmm. I live in Zone A. Our office is in Zone A. And um, I thought, you know, I could work through this. I'm kind of on the edge of Zone A. I'm really not on the edge of Zone A. I told myself that. So you've learned. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so I wasn't. But I didn't think the water could possibly come up that far. I thought Manhattan Beach would flood. Right. The Emmons Avenue bulkhead would flood. I didn't think it would come up, you know, half a mile inland, um, yeah. in some areas a mile inland. Um, and you kind of, I if you look at the chronology of posts on my site, I mean, we, we were just constantly hammering them out. Every yeah. few minutes we had different reports about what was going on, stuff that was coming in from readers, stuff that we were seeing. And then it's like, you know, there's a post where it's like, there's water on my street. I now need to go and do this, this, and this. I have to worry about keeping our equipment dry, all that. Um, so I'm signing off for a moment. And as soon as I hit publish, um, our power went, everything went. Um, and the only thing I had as well was my uh, cell phone. And I had yeah. a colleague um, who I was calling reports into, but you know, I I kind of look back at that and wonder how that looked to our readers, where yeah. you know there was all these frantic updates, and then all of a sudden there was silence. Yeah, and you know, it's, it certainly reflected my own mindset at the time. So, and I just think about that moment when you're sitting there in the dark and you're just like illuminated by your phone, watching the battery bar go down with every sort of tweet that you send out or post that comes in, and that was everybody's reality that mm -hmm. this is all you had to let the world know you were okay or you were in need mm -hmm. was your phone and it was dwindling and even in Coney Island where they lost cell phone towers mm -hmm. even there was no way for them to even communicate mm -hmm. so going from that place of the storm is coming to oh we're in the middle of it what do you think of this sort of advent of technology where we were here going off of tweets and sharing stuff and information with people and you have a blog and then you guys getting the paper out? How is this sort of intersection of the electronic and the traditional media played out at this moment? Do you think there's any lessons in what we saw from that sort of intersection of new media and blogs versus everyone with Twitter and a camera phone is all of a sudden an action news journalist sort of thing? Well, I found, um, you know, we're still traditional media, like right. the Daily News, of course. So we still have um, a system of the way we report stories. So in a big mega disaster like that, we're sort of dispatched to different corners of the city. So the morning after, I went to Staten Island with a really good photographer that I work with. And um, Staten Island, your phone didn't work. Yeah. South Brooklyn, your phone didn't work. So we're reporting. You're supposed to be calling in your notes. Yeah. But you can't. And so um, what I found is we had to drive all the way out of Staten Island into center Brooklyn mm -hmm. in order to you know, relay what we're seeing. Yeah. But um, A, the frustration on my side, but B, that's when it hit me that imagine I was living in Staten Island or the southern tip of Brooklyn. I can't use my phone. There is no electricity. There was like literally nothing there. Yeah. You couldn't go to the bathroom. There were no stores open. You couldn't get a cup of coffee. You couldn't get water. So as the days went on, um, I have a bicycle. I live in South Manhattan. I would bike to Brooklyn more or less pack, like almost like a war correspondent yeah, in like my hometown bag. borough, literally, yeah. with water, with um, batteries, with flashlights, with a change of clothes. So I couldn't stay at home because we had no power. And just more or less bike as much as possible and yeah. just do my stories that way. And it was interesting. It was almost like a liberating experience because mm -hmm. I've, when else have we lived in New York City when you're, nothing works? Yeah. It was it's interesting. And also... Um, it made you really rely on like what you learned in day camp when you were nine. <laughs> like everything was out the window. Yeah. Because you just have to survive almost, literally. Well, all those things that we are lucky enough to take for granted, that all the stuff you do in the first 20 minutes, whether you get up and put on the TV, brush your teeth, get coffee, all of those little things, just the luxury of having something dry even, like dry socks. It's like mm -hmm. in the first 20 minutes, all of those things that happen and processes that start for the rest of the day. But I know that you were interrupted. You said, you are in zone A and you had water in your house. Yep, yeah. 
And you say 20 minutes, and I think about the 20 minutes that from seeing water on my corner mm -hmm. to it being in front of my house, and right. then another 20 minutes until it was waist deep, and mm. then another 20 minutes until my basement was gone. Yeah. The water came up within about four inches of my, of my first floor. First. And we're very lucky because we have a raised yeah. uh, building. My neighbors across the street don't have that, and a lot of people in Sheepshead Bay, um, Manhattan Beach, Plum Beach don't. I mean, there's a lot of bungalows, for example, that just wiped off the map. Yeah. Um, so that's what I think of when I think of the 20 minutes. But, you know, talking about that intersection of new media and old media, um, you know, there, there were a lot of great things. You know, we were able to really source our story through what was going on um, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, you know, through emails that people were sending us, photos, a lot of text messages. Um, but there's also weaknesses with that. I mean, you mentioned the Coney Island Hospital fire that started with a Twitter um, post. Um, and in reality, it was actually a car in front of the hospital that was on fire, which is nowhere near right. as significant, you know, especially when everything is kind it's of like bursting into flames at yeah. that time. Um, and, you know, one area where, you know, I'm kind of left disappointed, and you'll have to excuse me, was with the, the traditional city media um, in those first few days after it. You know, there was a lot of focus on on Red Hook and, and kind of easily accessible areas, and there wasn't as much on Coney Island or Seagate or Breezy Point, which later did come out. Yeah. But then there was even a problem with that, is that there were these great dramatic photos of Coney Island and Seagate and Breezy Point. So, so that's say, where uh, the city sent all their resources, because right. the city... And this, to me, is the hugest failing of it, is the city didn't bother, in, as far as I could tell, to do, the to do a, a neighborhood by neighborhood or yeah. block by block survey and deploy resources as needed. They right. kind of followed the Follow media's the attention. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, one role that Sheepshead Bites plays uh, normally when it comes to storms is, all right, when there's a storm uh, or a bad weather event or something like that, we go out, we get photos of... Uh, what's going on, take video, talk to people, yeah. we put it up on the site, and then other media pays attention. Well, we got a little bit of that out in the day after the storm, but besides dealing with my own personal issues, you know, it, it became so much more apparent that as, as great as that is, you know, is, is putting out that damage and letting people know what's going on, people in my neighborhood, my readers, they really needed the information for FEMA. They needed to know you know, how to, how to get water out. What, what are the scams they need to be looking out right. for? Um, so, I mean, we, we became more of a, a, an information service at that point, just trying to, to get out, like, how do you live right. the next three days? You know, how do you do that? Um, and because of that, I think the damage in Sheepshead Bay, Manhattan Beach, Plum Beach, um, even Garrison Beach was overlooked for uh, quite some time. Right. And don't get me wrong, there was some excellent reporting, especially by the Daily News, um, a little after that, um, especially stuff like what was going on in the NYCHA houses and um, issues with LIPA. And yeah. So what's going to be the sort of endearing story of the storm for you, Simone? Something that you stick up for the mainstream media first. Well, That's come on, okay. mainstream media, <laughs> bring on. it. Well, um, I'm not going to speak for our competitors, but the Daily News, we too were flooded out, and we lost mm -hmm. our offices, and some of our colleagues lost their homes as well. So mm -hmm. um, should that be an excuse? I don't really know. But I know my colleagues and I worked tirelessly around the clock. I spent the first day um, in Staten Island for almost back and forth with transmitting to like 12 yeah. one of the next morning, mm -hmm. that um, I adopted Lower Manhattan since because that's where I'm from, and I felt those stories weren't um, getting heated to. We had all the seniors who live on Grand Street, so mm -hmm. I wanted to focus my reporting there. We had reporters in Brighton, Coney Island, literally all over the place, and I felt out of the mainstream media in the city, we were doing the best we could with what we had and um, definitely represented being what we call ourselves New York's hometown paper. So I thought, um, considering... What we did not have, we did a, a really incredible job. And once we sort of got back on our feet, we started paying attention to the Manhattan Beach and the you know the southern tips of the borough. But unfortunately, um, like I, we were just without like more or less printing presses, mm -hmm. and it was really hard for us to do our jobs, but we still do. So I will not 
let that jab go. <laughs> that, that's fine. And it's, it's not a jab. I actually do think, especially the Daily News did an incredible job. And I understand the, the struggles that, that was going on all over with all reporters, especially once you get rid of mass transit. Yeah. You, you guys were reporting the story and you were the story. Yeah. So it's like you were in it and trying to report on it and no one would fault either yeah. approach or entity for the stories that they did that came out of that thing. Because just as we sort of have this march back to normalcy, it's a huge deal that people can turn to those sources that they're used to for news and information and find out what is happening. And you guys both did that. And that's the reason that you're both here today. So thank you again. And just moving forward, then the next question was, what is the story that's going to be the sort of endearing thing for you that you covered that either made it to the paper or didn't that you were out there and got to experience? Well, what I'm interested in is um, housing. Yeah. Where do we move forward from there? So many people lost their homes. Um, sort of the next step in that. Also health. Like, there's so many people living with mold, mm. which even I've been in a lot of houses, I'm sure you have as well, including your own, that has a lot of mold. And what happens if you breathe this in constantly? Like, I do have the luxury of returning home, right. but it's, uh, so many people are staying. And, um, I think as the months go on, we're going to see the effect of that on our health and also people's budgets, their bank accounts. FEMA doesn't pay for everything. Yeah. So how much will it cost Brooklyn to rebuild and how is everyone going to pay for it? So I'm just, you know, this is something that hit us hard and it'll be interesting to see, you know, where we'll be from a year and now and also what happens again if there's another hurricane. Well, there's going to be another hurricane. What are we going to do? You can't always say, can't negotiate with the weather. Yeah. You can't say, hey, weather, you came last year enough, you know, yeah. back off. What do you mean by a mini beat for people who are watching right now? What is that shake down to? Well, a mini beat for our viewers at home is something us journalists call when um, it's not like a real beat. We call real beats like schools or politics or yeah. crime, like the meat and potatoes of news gathering. Mini beat are sort of smaller things within that. So Hurricane Sandy, at least in my mind, unleashed you know, this knowledge of understanding weather, mm -hmm. um, how to prepare for it, and also the effects of it. And... Um, on the human condition, which sounds a little bit much, but health, you know, your psyche. Yeah. I interviewed a lot of kids I'm, who are literally afraid of rain, which I don't blame them. If I lived in South Brooklyn and was flooded out, I would probably yeah. be afraid of rain, too, if I was nine years old. So it's just a lot of things that just like got plopped down into Brooklyn, and now we have to figure out what to do with it. Ned, what about you? We know that you are still dealing with the mini beat, which has become your life and the cleanup and working at the same time. What story has emerged for you that sort of has stuck with you through this? It, it's, it's hard to say. I think, I mean, going forward, I, I think you're, you're right on about what the stories are going to be. I mean, I think health is going to be a major story, yeah. uh, especially the mold issues, like you said. Uh, I think development is going to be uh, a major issue going forward. I mean, what, what's going to happen? I mean, they, they've DOB said they tagged, what, 200 houses? Yeah, it's be and that demolished. was, I think, two weeks ago. Yeah. So who knows what that count is now? And trying to get the list of those homes has not been easy. Uh, I don't know if you've tried you've or got to walk around sticker hunting yeah isn't it? pretty much yeah. and um yeah the city has said that they don't know what they're going to do if they're going to allow people to rebuild if they're going to say areas are now you know you, you just, it's exactly yeah. you know this is a problem zone don't go there um and this is a city that for the past you know 20 years has put an emphasis on its waterfront and developing its waterfront so i mean that to me is the enduring story that started before um, before Sandy and it's going to be here long after and I think now it's a lot more real for a lot of people Where would you like to see us sort of put our attentions and be focused on as we move to the next phase of recovery? I mean, I think the economic factor is, is huge I, I don't just mean in what it costs the city I mean, yeah. you know uh, one of the more frustrating things about operating in Sheepshead Bay and also being the publisher is that I am very in tune with what's going on with the businesses there. And, you know, as opposed to Manhattan Beach or um, Garrison Beach or many of these other areas that were hit, um, this is our, uh, a neighborhood business corridor. Mm -hmm. And every business was shut down by it. Um, yeah. I would say less than a third are back up right now. Um, as a publisher, that means it's also my advertising space, which, you know, it's, it's not about money in my pocket. It's about what I'm able to Just do for the community happen. now when they need me the most. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I really think you know what's going on with with that is a, a story that I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to because I, I happen to think that kind of main streets in communities are you know the backbone to everything. It's the backbone of the community. It's the backbone to democratic functions. It's yeah. everything. Um, and um, yeah, so that's that's what I'm going to be looking at as well as these health issues and. So Elmo, Lindsay Lohan, uh, Mitt and Obama having lunch, there's all of these things that are swirling now and that we have to hear about apparently, but where would you like that focus to sort of go as well, Simone? Um, again, when you work in a big organization like I do, you, you know, our jobs are sort of focused on what we cover. So I cover Brooklyn, so right. while the Elmo story, you know, how horrific. <laughs> I cover Brooklyn, I'm from Brooklyn, so um, I'm concerned with you know, people who I would meet every day. How is it for the Mr. Smith or Mrs. Brown to live like this? So my interest is sort of communicating the stories to people out there yeah. um, about people who live here. So whether that's health, whether it's, you know, how is she going to pay to rebuild her roof? And is this the part of a bigger trend? Like, again, coming from sort of the traditional media, we try to look at trends. Like, I spend a lot of time going through statistics, mm -hmm. and um, right now I'm going through a very long, arduous report written by a government official about FEMA, critiquing FEMA, what they did with Katrina, right. and trying to pick up trends. So just because um, trying to, I feel like I'm getting all these jabs here about being a traditional media person in this no, chair. No, it's jabbing. We're just jab. having the open exchange. Okay. It's no jab. I'm just saying the news cycle has moved on. Like No, it, it has. We already, you know, it's and, and, and that's the fact of the, and even for people who are in the thick of it, people who still are cleaning out their basements and reframing things and trying to get rid of the damn mold, they want to hear about who got into a fight at Thanksgiving or what happened just as a means of escapism. It can't all be like refitting your damn basement. Like there has to be a release valve out there as well. No, of course. So I think our job is, is to tell stories that will pull at your heartstrings. So yeah. while everyone does not want to read about the person cleaning out their basement yeah, yeah. or has some beef with FEMA. You do want to read about, you know, the little girl who can't breathe right and her parents can't afford, you know, this new medicine because maybe her health care won't cover something that possibly could or could not be related to mold. Yeah. And these are the stories that we have to keep an eye on. What is new? That's something that I haven't, you know, crossed our radar yet. So our goal and our job is to just keep our eyes to the ground, keep our eyes peeled yeah. for things that um, only tug at our heartstring, but we know will tug at our readers' heartstring in the midst of Elmo and Rami, who we still don't really talk about anymore, Obama and Susan Rice and all those people. Right. So just as we are wrapping up here, I wanted to ask you, you both cover Brooklyn both hyper-locally and extensively, and I wanted just from your personal views, what is it going to take for you to say, okay, we're back, if not completely back, but back on track, we're returning turning to our sense of normalcy, whatever that means for a particular beat, mini beat, or neighborhood, what do you, what's going to be the day when you're like, okay, I can see the road to recovery, we're like on the path already? Well, I mean, I can already see the road to recovery, and we're on that path. I mean, that started from day one. Um, so go further down the road When I stop talking about the recovery, okay. I mean, I, I got to say never, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, I can't say in 50 years I'll be talking, saying Sandy, 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 but whenever a storm comes in, you know, the comparison is going to be made. Anytime an evacuation is made and, and, you know, and people say, like, well, you know, last year it was nothing. Well, I'm like, yeah, but, yeah, 25, 50 years ago it was you something. Saw Sandy. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's huge. It's, this is a major historical milestone for our community. Yeah. It, it is for all of New York City, but New York City is um, a little more... Uh, quick to move on than yeah. I think <laughs> various it's communities themselves are. One of those before yeah. and after moments where everything for at least us, the people who are in the power to watch this now, it's one of those moments where you'll measure things before Sandy happened or after. Mm -hmm. So the road to recovery, how will you know that once you're back on the beat and you're covering Brooklyn, that to say Sandy is like really safely in the rear view mirror? I will agree with you, never. Um, my concern is next summer. Are mm -hmm. we going to see this again? You know, is this maybe just some fluke and perhaps we'll have a worse storm that can destroy even more neighborhoods? Like, I um, just think this just puts something, a big pressing incident, uh, incident like a, I don't want to get into the climate politics of things right now, yeah. but we have to pay attention. Well, it's going to. I know. And, um, and I don't think we can ever forget this. I think this is sort of, 
the beginning of something new. Yeah. And we need to, especially young journalists like ourselves, this is something that maybe 30 years ago, you know, um, our predecessors didn't have to deal with or didn't really have to pay much attention to. And when's the last time we were kids that you hear about a hurricane hitting New York? Yeah. Sounds like a joke. Mm -hmm. And no, it's real. And our next step is just to rebuild and um, look for ways that hopefully this will not happen again. Because who's to say the next storm won't be as powerful or even worse? There are these people who really just stepped up mm -hmm. and just, it's not what they do, but they've done it so well. And you're like, go sit down, like take a break. It's okay. It's they, they seem to have the weight of the world on their shoulders, but in the best possible way that it makes them act and not shrink. But they're really out there and they're doing a great job and we'll never hear about it unless we say their names because they're just in it and not doing it for glory or something. <sighs> well, um, you know, it's kind of cliche at this point to say, like, oh, these things bring out you know, the best in people. But mm -hmm. I, I really do have to say that you know, there is no one person. It, it really was all of my neighbors yeah. um, stepped up, all of my readers stepped up, and it, it wasn't just um, the organizations that do do this every day or who do some sort of service every day. It was, you know, there was a real estate company, Fillmore Real Estate. It's Brooklyn's largest. They're headquartered in Sheepshead Bay. You know, they pretty much stopped what they were doing and turned their entire business towards recovery efforts. That's a private organization right. that, you know, its, it's main Not drive is to make anyone. money, you know. <laughs> and they didn't care about it. And they put thousands of dollars into it and they set up a website and they were collecting money and they were coordinating things. Um, that's one example. Um, you know, one that I was amazed by was we put up a page, you know, kind of in that moment when we were helpless because we, we, we don't just function as a news outlet. We're also sort of a a civic, um, yeah. sort of like a civic group, even though we're not, and I, I definitely don't want to be that. <laughs> but people call us You're for information or say, yeah. we need help with this, that, or the other right. thing. And um, so I was inundated with that. So we put up a page, um, I forget, the Hurricane Sandy Information Exchange and Volunteer Network. Mm -hmm. And it was just so people can put these requests in and then volunteers who were in zone B or in zone A and not so badly hurt or whatever, they were going out and checking on people's grandparents yeah. who, you know, they, they might live on the other side of the country and they can't reach them yeah. and stuff like that. And they were awesome. doing that and they were really helping a lot of people. And, you know, I haven't even had the time to stop and acknowledge these people on the site. Yeah. And, you know, what they did was tremendous and it, it really was, you know, very encouraging to me. So, so that was your first acknowledgement. More to yes. come on Sheep's Head Bites uh, <laughs> blog. But Simone, quickly, is there any group or person that you'd like to just say good job while you got the chance? Um, not, and I met so many people um, mm -hmm. from Brooklyn whose neighbors were affected by this and more or less camped out if they had like the one office in the neighborhood with light or they had access to bringing water into the neighborhood like walked up and down yeah. of the NYCHA staircase 20, 30 flights of stairs and um, to all of you, thank you. Because I got some water when I was stuck out there too <laughs> from you guys so I appreciate it. I was very thirsty. So there's lots of appreciation, and I appreciate these two for being here. Ned Burke, the editor at Sheephead Bites, and New York Daily News reporter Simone Weichelbaum. Thank you for being here today, and we thank you guys for watching. I want you to know that we're continuing to aggregate your story, so please continue to share things at our email, which is bsb at brickartsmedia.org. We hope you continue to contribute, to volunteer, Watch and share your stories. So thanks for watching Intersect. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.